EKG Burst Part 7 This type of beat occurs after atrioventricular dissociation when the atria regain control of the ventricles. This is called the capture beat. Capture beat occurs during AV dissociation when the atria regain control of the ventricles. This beat, or sometimes beats, you can have more than one, come from the atria and conduct normally and thus will look normal. And what is AV dissociation anyways? This may be an appropriate time to discuss the term because it can be somewhat confusing. Strictly speaking, AV dissociation occurs when the atria and ventricles beat independent of one another, and thus we could consider complete heart block to be a form of AV dissociation. In practice, however, AV dissociation usually refers to the situation in which the ventricular rate is equal to or greater than the atrial rate. And this event can never occur in complete heart block. So when we talk about AV dissociation, we typically are not talking about complete heart block. It's, it's just semantics, and if you hear or see the, the word AV dissociation, they probably are not referring to complete heart block. And then just to be sure, always confirm that by making sure the ventricular rate is greater than the atrial rate. So that's how you should check that. So again, um, think of it like this. In AV dissociation, the ventricular rate is equal to or exceeds the atrial rate. And in complete heart block, the atrial rate should always exceed the ventricular rate. And the underlying mechanisms are completely different as well. Complete heart block, also called third degree AV block, is a disorder of the cardiac conduction system at the level of either the AV node, bundle of Hiss, or Purkinje system. And then the ventricular escape mechanism that goes along with it occurs anywhere distal to that block. Now contrast this to ventricular tachycardia, another dangerous cause of AV dissociation. In this condition, VTAC, the AV dissociation is due to the ventricular rate being faster than the intrinsic sinus rate. In summary then, know the terminology, know how to differentiate complete heart block from AV dissociation, and you should be fine. What does an echo beat refer to when talking about AV dissociation? An echo beat? Okay, in AV dissociation, an echo beat occurs when an impulse is conducted retrogradely through the AV node to produce an atrial capture that, on return to the ventricles, produces a narrow QRS complex. This is different from the capture beat, which begins in the atria. An echo beat conducts retrograde and then returns or echoes back. Also note that echo beats are referred to as reciprocal beats. Okay, what are fusion beats then? And if you don't know, take a guess. Fusion beat. Here you have a ventricular impulse and a second supraventricular impulse that simultaneously activate the ventricular myocardium. The morphology is intermediate between that of a sinus beat and a purely ventricular complex, so it's kind of like a hybrid beat. If you see fusion beats during a wide beat tachycardia, the diagnosis with 100% accuracy is this. Ventricular tachycardia. Fusion beats during wide beat tachycardia unequivocally gives you a diagnosis of VTAC on ECG. What is the most common cause of a wide complex tachycardia? Wide complex tachycardia. Definition QRS duration greater than 120 milliseconds and a heart rate greater than 100. Most common cause is VTAC. 80% of the time, a wide complex tachycardia is VTAC. And if structural heart disease is present, that percentage goes up to 95%. And who is going to have structural heart disease? Which type of patient? Well, how about older patients with previous MIs? Definitely. Other causes of wide complex tachycardia besides VTAC include what? Okay, if it's not VTAC, then it has to be supraventricular tachycardia, right? 
and there are many causes that we simply don't have time for, but basically any supraventricular tachycardia in conjunction with conduction disease could cause wide complex tachycardia. So people with SVTs and concomitant left bundle or right bundle branch blocks, um, people with antidromic AV reentrant tachycardia, and so on and so forth. There are the Brugada criteria for helping you diagnose these as well. So you can look those up, the Brugada criteria. Okay, and I just realized that I may have used the phrase wide beat tachycardia because that's how I have it written in my notes. I'm not sure if I said that, but if I did, I apologize. I don't like that term. And it actually just means wide complex tachycardia. So wide beat tachycardia and wide complex tachycardia are used interchangeably. Oh man, speaking of definitions, you may have heard this nonsensical phrase before. Delayed onset of intrinsicoid deflection. What does this mean? Delayed onset of intrinsicoid deflection. So first, onset of intrinsicoid deflection is defined as the time from the beginning of the R wave to the peak of the R wave. So a better name for this would be R wave peak time. But instead of seeing the phrase delayed R wave peak time, you'll probably see the phrase delayed onset of intrinsicoid deflection. So what is this? Delayed onset of intrinsicoid deflection is a longer than normal time for the R wave to complete its rise from base to peak. And why might someone have delayed onset of intrinsicoid deflection or delayed R wave peak time? LVH. It's actually another criteria for diagnosing left ventricular hypertrophy, one that does not rely on voltage. So if your voltage is all messed up for some reason, look at the R wave peak time. When the myocardium is thickened, it takes longer than normal for the R wave to complete its rise from base to peak. Delayed onset of intrinsic deflection is also seen in bundle branch blocks and a few other things. And what is the normal value for the R wave peak time? Normal R wave peak time? less than 0.05 seconds, or approximately one small box. And finally, the reason I mentioned delayed r wave peak time to begin with goes back to our discussion on the Brugada algorithm for determining wide complex SVTs from VTAC. So in 2010, Brugada et al. published a new criterion based on the r wave peak time in lead two. And they found that if the R wave peak time is greater than 0.05 seconds, the likelihood of VTAC is very high. And they report a positive likelihood ratio of 34.8. So again, R wave peak time in lead two, if the R wave peak time is greater than 0.05 seconds, you have a higher likelihood of having VTAC versus a supraventricular tachycardia. And remember, you have a high pretest probability to begin with all of all cases of wide complex tachycardia that come in, 80% of those are ventricular tachycardia. Now, if that patient has a structural heart abnormality, such as a pace patient who had a previous MI, that probability goes all the way up to 95%. So you should keep that in mind also. <laughs> 